Tainig, this one. Over here, Binyamin, the youngest brother, is accused of stealing the goblet of the viceroy. And as we read last week, this was planted by Yosef, because it's the only way he was able to enter into this dialogue of why he's going to retain him as a slave. And ultimately, he would force Yaakov to come down to Egypt. Because Yaakov is not going to be separated from his son. This is the last vestige of Rachel. So we're going to add Cheney. He now narv on this. So Yehuda is coming and explaining and showing clearly that this was a setup. And Binyam is innocent. And this man who claims that he's so compassionate and he fears God, the man is cruel beyond cruelty. So he says to Yehuda, Yehuda says to the vice of Yehuda, when he will see that the Youth, the lad is not there, he will die. And then you will bring the old age of your servant, our father, with yogon, with angst, into the grave. There's a Gemara that Mark tells us in Tainus that, that the three, there were three shepherds of Israel, three leaders, Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam. And the Gemara cites a posuk, a verse, it's a Gemara Tainus, that the three of them passed away during the same month. They all passed away during the same month. So Mark asks, but we know that Miriam passed away in one month, Aaron passed away in another month. And Moshe passed away in a different month. Each passed away in a different month. So how could the Navi say that I took the three shepherds in one month? So our answer is that when Miriam passed away, we find the wellsprings cease to give water because the, the bear, the wellspring in the desert was in the merit of Miriam. It was reinstated in the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu. Then when Aaron passes away, the clouds of glory which protected clouds from the desert dispersed. Are we vulnerable to many, to many issues? We were under attack. We were vulnerable to the elements. It was reinstated in the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu. So ultimately, Moshe Rabbeinu, in the merit of Moshe covered the wellspring, he covered the Ane Yaakovot, and the man, the manna was in the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu. So the Jews were secure because of Moshe Rabbeinu's merit. So Mara says that Miriam passes away, they realized how valuable Miriam was. Because until then, they didn't realize it was her merit. And therefore, they mourned her. But once it was reinstated, as you say, people have short memories. Moshe Rabbeinu picked up the slack, as they say. Aaron passes away, they realizes they realized Ani Akavot, or in the merit of Aaron, it's reinstated. So once Moshe Rabbeinu covered all their amenities in the desert, physical and spiritual, they didn't feel the pain of the loss of Aaron and Miriam. It's only when Moshe passed away, then they realized that they had nothing. Then they realized at that moment how valuable Miriam was and how valuable Aaron was. So therefore, when the Navi says they lost all three of them during one month, it only resonated, it touched them in this very painful way when Moshe passed away, because then they only knew then to what degree they missed all three of them. So it's the equivalent of passing away during one month, although each one passed away during a different month. Yaakov says, I lost Rachel. What was my consolation? I have Yosef, I have Binyamin. Yosef disappears. I have Binyamin. So therefore, Binyamin is still solace, a consolation for me. But if, God forbid, Binyamin dies, there's nothing which represents what Rachel was or Yosef. As a result of that, it's as if all three of them passed away at the same moment. Therefore, then I would truly go to the grave in this extreme level of grief and pain, which is not to be related to. That's what Yaakov was saying.
Now, Yehuda was the fourth son. And Yosef knew exactly the age order. Of course, it says when originally they had come back, he had seated them at a meal, and he, each of them he, he put according to their birth, according to their mothers. She knew exactly who was the fourth son. He identified him as the fourth son. Through his divination, they believed, they, they thought he was a, a heathen. He was able to, so if that's the case, why is you the spokesman? Ruven should be the spokesman. Shimon should be the spokesman. Why is Yehuda the spokesman? So he says, Ki avtcha orav esanar. Mimovi lemo. Your servant has taken responsibility. I am the guarantor for the lad, for my father, Lamar. I said to him, If I don't bring him back to you, I will sin to my father for all the days, meaning I fought for my share in the world to come. Therefore, for me, everything's at stake here. If I don't bring back Binyamin, my physical life is worthless, my purpose is worthless, Therefore, whatever it takes to bring Binyamin back, I will do to bring him back, to guarantee he comes back to my father. And I am speaking on behalf of Binyamin because I have the greatest level of responsibility more than all of them. Because my father only released him because I assumed this responsibility. Now, Rabbi, one second. He had said initially that when he took Binyamin, he excommunicated himself, that if Binyamin is not brought back to Yaakov, he forfeits the share in the world to come. That's what he had said. So the Gemara says in Tainus that a killas chochem, if God forbid a chochem curses a person, even on a condition, a conditional curse, it, it, it meets its mark. It has an effect. Over here, he executed himself from the world to come. It was, it was conditional. If I don't bring him back, then I will. You didn't realize that the consequence of that, even though he brought Binyam back to his father, it actually took effect. And the Gemara tells us, and Rashi cites this in Sosa Brocha, that Yehuda's neshama was not admitted into yesh the Mesifta Durakia, into the heavenly yeshiva, where they studied Torah at that special level, because of this conditional excommunication which he accepted upon himself. Why? So Tosis explains in Marcos because since at that moment it was not within his ability to guarantee it, entering into a questionable cherem, the cherem takes effect, the excommunication takes effect, regardless, even if you meet the condition. And that's what happened to Yehuda. You didn't realize to what degree he was getting involved here that even if Yaman comes back, he's going to have the consequences of the cherem unless it's released. And only Moshe's tefillah released him from the consequence of that cherem. Good, Bernie. Yeah, getting back to Yaakov for a second, why didn't Yosef request that Binyamin and Yaakov come to uh, Mitzrayim? And um, what, And if Yosef didn't recommend that, why didn't Yaakov insist that he come with Binyamin to Mitzrayim? He had grandchildren who were old enough to take care of the rest of the family in Canaan. He had, you know, they could have been taken care of. And then even when Yaakov would come, they would all still bow down to Yosef. So why is it that Yaakov, Yosef didn't ask for both to come, okay. or why Yaakov didn't want to come himself Good. to protect Yaakov? Good question. Good question. Now, why, you know, last week in the Midrash, the Midrash says that why was all the animosity and this dynamic in Yosef's brothers, why did Hashem allow it to come about? Because if it wouldn't have come, Yaakov would have gone to Egypt in shackles. He would have been forced to go to Egypt. Why? Yaakov, being who he was, understands exactly what Egypt is. He's not going there. Because of the levels and purity of Egypt, he's not going there under these circumstances. He would have to be forced to go. He'd have to be forced to go. So the Midrash says, what is it analogous to? You have a cow, a mother cow that's going to be slaughtered. And the slaughterer tries to take the cow into the location where it's going to be slaughtered. As much as they pull that cow, the cow's not going. Not going. They can't even force it. They're going to have to lift up the cow and carry it into that location to slaughter it. So what do they do? They take the calf of the cow and the 
cow nurses its calf, and they put the calf in that room where they're going to slaughter the mother. Once the calf is there, because of the compassion and the love that the mother has for its calf, although it knows it's going to slaughter, it's going into that room to nurse its calf. Because of Yaakov's love for Yosef, normally there's no way under no circumstances he's going to Egypt, because Egypt represents the antithesis of Kedusha, of spirituality. He's not going there. Therefore, he'd have to be put in shackles to be forced, forced to come there. But Yosef being there, his love for Yosef, regardless of what Egypt is, he's going to see Yosef before he dies. He may plan to come back, but he's going to Egypt. Once he's there, he's going to be there and he's going to pass away there. Because we find later in the Parsha that in this Parsha, it says that when he decided, he says, now my son's alive, I'm going to Egypt to see my son. It's explicit in the puzzle. So on his way to Egypt, Hashem comes to him in a prophecy. He says, Yaakov, Altiro, Mer de Mitzrayim. Don't be fearful to go to Egypt because I will take you there and I will bring you back. You have a guarantee you're coming back, meaning you're not going to be buried there. So the whole issue of Yaakov going there wasn't because he just didn't want to leave Eretz Yisrael. It was only because in terms of what Egypt represented, there's no way he's going. The only way he could go there is to, because Yosef is there. Now let's understand this. It's a good question. Just to clarify it. I mean, now that Yosef's there, if Egypt represents that location of impurity, which is the antithesis of what he represents, so why, even if Yosef's there, do you risk it all? So it's very interesting. I mean, I'm just thinking while I'm talking to you that when he, when he, when ya Yosef sends him, when they, they come back, he, it says he sent wagons, remember? He sent wagons. And when he saw the wagons, it says, Vatchi Ruach Yaakov. His spirit became alive. He started prophesying. When the brother said to Yosef, to Yaakov that Yosef is still alive, initially he didn't believe it. Didn't believe it. After 22 years not knowing, believing he's not alive. But when he saw the wagons, Rashi over there see, cites the Chazal, it represented the Egla Rufa, if you remember. The last halacha, which Yaakov had studied with Yosef, was the law of the Egla Rufa. And if you find a corpse outside of a community, and you can't locate the murderer, the community has to bring an Egla Rufa. A, a calf and break its neck in a valley, a whole story. Only then did Yaakov realize that Yosef was alive. Now, if he's sending the Egla Rufa, that means Yosef is still involved in, in, in the study of Torah. Still involved. Despite Yaakov knowing what Egypt was. Despite that. Now, he goes to Egypt and he sees Ephraim and Menashe. And he says to Yosef, Ephraim and Menashe were born to you before I came to Egypt. I wasn't here. And therefore, they are the equivalent of Reuven and Shimon. They will be tribes. What, what is one thing to do another? Meaning, that was a confirmation that just as Yaakov in Choron, when he was in the environment of Lovam, he was unscathed. In Lovam Garti, Taig Mitzvah Shamarti, Yosef in Egypt was the exact same thing. Yosef had all the abilities and the capacity of his father to deflect any spiritual impurity. Because to be able to raise two sons, like Ephraim and Nash in Egypt, despite the influence of what it represents, that confirms that you are like I am. You are no different than I am. Therefore, as I am the father of the Shvatim, your children, although they're my grandchildren, are the equivalent of my children, they'll be tribes. So only after ya Yaakov saw that, Yaakov knew Yosef is able to contend with all the issues and prepare for the Golos, and Klaus was going to survive. Because just as Yaakov was able to create this environment for his family to develop, to be the Shvatim, Yosef was able, despite Egypt, to create an environment that Claudius will be able to take root there, and despite what happens, after so many years they're leaving, and there's going to be a couple of Satora. But that's the reason why Yaakov did not want to go, because until he actually saw Yosef, was Yosef who he believed should have been, only then would he, would he, was he assured 
and comfortable and confident that things are going to be okay. That's the reason why Yaakov would not go. Taking Binyamin, say, I demand your father coming. He's not going. There's no way. Wake. As long as Binyamin's there, he's not going. Binyamin's there, and now Yosef finally reveals himself. He's going for Yosef. Because now he has to go evaluate. If Yosef's not Yosef, you know the story? There's no Kalal Yisro. If Yosef was affected by the impurity of Egypt, there was no future for Kalal Yisro. Yosef has to be Yosef, who was the Ben Zakunim. He had his capability, he, was, he had his wisdom, and he had all the challenges. Despite those challenges, he survived it. Then I know there's a clause. If not, it doesn't make a difference because there's no future in either case. That's why Yaakov only, when he heard Joseph was alive, only then did he go to Egypt. Rabbi, if Hashem guaranteed his return, why did he, have to, why did he make Yosef take an oath? Good question. I'll tell you, Al has a phenomenal memory. He always remembers the question I asked, asked, but he doesn't recall the, the answer I gave. I didn't say that. Okay, I'm waiting for the answer. <laughs> okay, it's fine. But we asked the question. Rabbi, you, just, you just say it so much better than me, so. Okay, terrific. That's, even that, he's, 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 he, always, he always has the apple for the teacher, Alan. That's one thing. His father taught him, always make sure you have that shiny apple for the teacher. Okay. So what we said then, and we said the same thing, we asked the same question. Avram Avinu, when he's going to Egypt, he says, God already promised him he's going to have children. He says, because if they take you, they may kill me. But if they may kill him, he's not having children. And God promised him when we went to Lech Lecha, you're going to be a great nation. I mean, he had no children at this moment. So if that's the case, what, what, what's even the consideration that he's going to be killed? So what did we say? We said, nevertheless, you have to do what we call tishtablus. You always have to take initiative and whatever the outcome is going to be, because that's going to be the way God wants the outcome to be. Meaning, because in reality, we need a miracle to live, to survive, as the Ramban says, we always try to minimize the miracle, that God shouldn't have to make it an overt miracle. Therefore, you have to take do what you can, so if we're able to leave, and they won't kill me because you, they believe you're my sister, Therefore, the miracle is not necessary. But ultimately, the miracle was necessary. Because power after was realized that she's a married woman because he was smitten by the angel. Yosef over here, Yaakov has to do what he can. He's leaving Egypt, no question. Because Hashem says, I take you down and you're coming back. But Yaakov has to orchestrate whatever is necessary that it should be under normal normal circumstances. And it was. Why did he adjure Yosef? Because Yosef, Yaakov understood because if he doesn't adjure Yosef, make him take the oath, Paro's going to say to Yosef, you forget about your father's oath. But Yosef himself took an oath to Paro that he will not divulge or reveal that he knows one, one language more than Paro. And he says, if you, don't, if you don't value my father's oath, I don't value the oath that I made to you and I will make it known and you're going to be dethroned. When Paro heard that, Paro says, your father's going to be taken. We will do what you're asking me to do. What your father requested, that request will be fulfilled. Okay, Jay, I see your your brow is, 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 is furrowed over there. What's the story? 